So you have a really stubborn case of golfer's or tennis elbow that you've been struggling with for months, maybe even a year or longer. You've seen doctors, physical therapists, and other professionals. You've tried all manner of tips, tricks, and treatments. If you're like most people, you probably regard it as a last resort, a serious decision not to be rushed into or taken lightly. But at some point, you have to ask yourself, when is it time to consider surgery? Hi, this is Alan Willett from Tennis Elbow Classroom and I'm going to do my best to offer some general guidance on this question and give you some things to help you in your decision-making process. And if you're listening to this someplace other than on my site, tenniselboclassroom.com, this podcast is accompanied by a full article that covers this question in greater detail. So look for the link to that nearby or do a search for surgery for tennis elbow, when is it time, five key points. Now instead of trying to cram the whole article into this episode, I'm going to focus on two of those five considerations. First off, how do you know if you're a good candidate for surgery? And secondly, how do you decide when it's time to give up on conservative measures and finally accept that it is time for surgery? So let's tackle the first question. Are you a good candidate for surgery? What exactly is the measure of what makes your tennis or golfer's elbow a good, great, or poor case for surgical intervention. It's not entirely dependent on how much pain you're in, how long you've been injured, or how debilitating your injury is, or not to, not to mention how, <laughs> how little patience you may have left, although those are the factors I'm sure you care the most about and are the most familiar with, and I'm probably too familiar with. So here's the first big takeaway right off. The amount of pain you're in, which is what's known as a subjective measure, may have nothing to do with how serious your injury is. Now, I've treated hundreds of people with golfers and tennis elbow over the past decade or two, non-surgically, with safe, effective hands-on therapy techniques. And I have to tell you, the patient suffering the most pain from tennis elbow I've ever seen in all that time, so far, had an MRI report that said there was nothing wrong with his elbow. That's right, there was no sign of damage to his tendons at all. No evidence other than his pain that he had tennis elbow. So we have to keep in mind that pain does not always mean that there's damage. And conversely, it's entirely possible to have significant damage to the tendons in question and not to be in significant pain. This is somewhat less likely, but we still have to be aware that damage does not always produce pain. So ultimately, it comes down to a combination of your subjective factors and how what you're experiencing how much pain, how debilitating that pain is, or or weakness, how much weakness you have, and the objective measures, as in how much damage there is to your tendons, which usually requires a scan of your elbow, usually an MRI. Is there a significant tear that's unlikely to heal on its own, for example? Once again, just because you have extreme pain and limited function, doesn't automatically mean you have extreme tendon damage that necessitates surgery. And once again, it's actually possible to have significant tendon damage and not to be in that much pain or even any pain and not to have much of of any strength or mobility limitations. Although again, it's a lot less likely than the other way around, meaning that you have a lot of pain but no damage, which is fairly common. So what you want, so to speak, is a combination of a clear diagnosis of significant tendon damage based on an MRI and significant pain and loss of your normal function. This is in loss of elbow mobility and grip strength usually and the fact that you you can't do the things that you need or love to do. That combo makes you a prime candidate for surgery, especially if you've exhausted your conservative options. One thing you probably don't want to do, however, is to have an MRI before you've decided whether you're ready to give up on conservative measures and go under the knife. Why? Because if you you haven't already decided with a high degree of confidence that you're ready to have surgery, it may be a waste of time and money. What I mean is if, based on the MRI, it looks like you're a good candidate for surgery objectively, but you're not already at your wit's end, your pain is just too persistent and debilitating, for example, and you feel like you've tried everything and your patience is exhausted subjectively, then the information the MRI provides may be useless to you. What if it comes back inconclusive? The MRI won't decide for you whether you should have surgery or not, and neither will your surgeon. 
nor should they. Although, hopefully, the MRI, the MRI will provide clear evidence of either significant damage or the lack thereof, hopefully. It's just that the information is of no use to you or anyone else if you're not prepared to act on it by having surgery, if the news is bad. It's not likely to otherwise change the course and nature of your treatment. Now, just in case you're on the fence, I should mention there is a diagnostic alternative you should know about that might come in handy, very handy, but it's not likely to be offered to you. You may need to ask for it. It's called the sonogram, or diagnostic ultrasound, or diagnostic sonography. It's a way of using sound waves to get an image of soft tissues in real time in a medical setting. You're probably familiar with how it's used to look at the fetus during pregnancy. This kind of scan is cheaper, faster, and easier than an MRI, but it's not often used for tendocebal diagnostics here in the States anyway, although it is used before and during platelet-rich plasma injection treatments. You may need to ask your orthopedist if they'll do it for you, and maybe they'll say it wouldn't be that helpful. I don't really understand why it isn't used for basic screening, though, considering how quickly and easily a sonogram can be used to take a look at your elbow and the tendons in question and see what kind of a state they're in. No, it's not as clear as an MRI, though. And if the tendons look bad and you decide to move forward towards surgery, your surgeon will, will still want to have an MRI in all likelihood. But on the plus side, if your tendons don't look all that bad and you're not in terrible pain and not ready to give up on more conservative options, it may save you a trip to the MRI and its attendant costs and inconveniences. And it could help, help, help you put the idea of surgery on the back burner for a while, hopefully permanently. Maybe you just need more time and more effort to recover. So let's talk about the kind of damage the MRI or, or sonogram is, is most likely to reveal, what your surgeon is looking for and is one or more of three conditions in particular. The first and most likely is tendinosis, which is the state of degeneration in your tendon. That means the tendon is breaking down and not repairing, which is the essence of tennis and golfer's elbow. And there are degrees of severity, from mild to moderate to severe. The second possibility is a tear in the tendon. Usually the tendon is tearing away from where it attaches to the bone at the lateral epicondyl in the case of tennis elbow or the medial epicondyl for golfers. And again, there are degrees of severity from mild to severe. And the third possibility, third possible abnormality is bone spurs. In, in a smaller but not insignificant percentage of cases, bone spurs form where the tendon attaches to the bone technically known as an anthesophyte, in case you see that on your MRI report and no one has explained what it means to you. I'm not going to address this since it's not my forte. It's less common and I don't have much experience with it. I just thought I should include it. Chances are, though, if you've had tennis or golfer's elbow for six months or longer and haven't been able to recover from it, you likely have at least some tendinosis. Again, that's tendon degeneration. But if tendon degeneration is all the MRI scan or sonogram shows, and it's mild, or even moderate, not too severe, that alone doesn't make your injury a slam dunk obvious case for surgery. So at what point is the damage likely too much to recover from without surgery? Generally speaking, tendon degeneration past the moderate stage, heading into the severe stage, becomes unlikely to heal without drastic intervention, which, which usually means surgery. So if your diagnosis is severe tendinosis, and especially if it includes a tear, worse still if that tear is moderate to severe, you may be a very good candidate for surgery and may not be able to recover without it. Of course, precisely where that line of demarcation lies for you, or any individual, it's hard to say. Excuse the pun, but it's definitely more cut and dry when it comes to tears. Tendon tears, usually being the most serious kind of damage, are often deal breakers, especially if it's anything worse than a mild tear. Yes, it's possible for smaller, milder tears to heal without surgery, but for moderate tears, the difficulty of healing seems to go up significantly. It gets a lot more challenging, although not necessarily completely impossible if you're really, really motivated. Severe tears, however, are basically impossible to recover from without surgery. So once again, you have a good chance of recovering without surgery from mild or even moderate degeneration, even with a small tear. However, if your MRI or sonogram scan 
show severe de degeneration or moderate to severe tear in your tendon, then you're facing a much bigger challenge and the case for surgery gets a lot stronger. Now we do have to keep in mind there are a lot of other factors to take into consideration like your age, your overall level of health and fitness, and whether you've had any cortisone shots. Cortisone has a well-documented significant risk of weakening tendons and making long-term recovery a lot more difficult, especially where multiple injections have been given. How motivated you are is also a big factor. How hard are you willing to work at it in order to avoid the surgeon's scalpel or the arthroscope? Which brings us to our second question. How do you know when it's time to give up on more conservative treatments and finally accept it's just time for surgery? This is probably the toughest question since it's ultimately a personal one that only you can decide. Because you probably want to be very confident it's your last resort. You've done everything you possibly can to treat your tennis or golfer's elbow conservatively. You probably don't want to throw in the towel too soon. And even if you believe you need it, are you prepared for the hassles, risks, and inconveniences of surgery, including the long recovery and rehab time, the possibility that it will fail? After all, an 80 to 90% success rate for this surgery still means one or two people out of 10 will end up no better off and probably in worse pain. It gets a lot easier to decide, of course, if you have an MRI and it shows conclusive severe damage to your tendon, especially a big tear. And all logic suggests you're just not going to be able to heal that damage without surgery. And if you have severe or persistent pain, or weakness, and it's interfering with your work, hobbies, or sport, generally making your life just miserable, you just can't live with it. Whether you can live with it or not, whether you have to give up things that you, you love to do is, is naturally going to weigh heavily in your decision. But what if you're on the borderline, so to speak? Your MRI is not conclusive, the damage is mild to moderate, and you have no significant tendon tearing. And your pain's manageable, although it's a nuisance. It's not terribly debilitating. I mean, you could consider platelet-rich plasma therapy. That's still a type of surgery, but it's a lot less invasive. It involves injections, but no incisions, and it has a much shorter recovery period. But let me ask you this. Have you had any therapy that's designed to treat what I'm, what I'm convinced is the root of the problem, at least locally in your forearm? What I'm referring to is chronic muscle tension in your muscles, in your wrist extensor muscles if you have tennis elbow, or in your wrist flexor muscles if you have golfer's elbow. In particular, I'm talking about deep, sticky muscle adhesions, which restrict and shorten those muscles, putting an excessive load on the tendons they're connected to and the degeneration, possible scar tissue in your tendons, which weakens them and which is likely responsible for the worst of the pain. I've helped a lot of people recover by treating their muscles and tendons by hand, including people with tendon degeneration, of course. Remember that mild or moderate tendon de degeneration, also known as tendinosis, can heal. It can be reversed. You know, we have to keep in mind that tendons have to be able to heal and regenerate. Otherwise, we'd be in big trouble. It's just that the vast majority of treatments, therapies, remedies, and so-called cures don't treat and address those muscle and tendon root issues, at least not with any efficiency. I mean, you might assume that when going in for physical or physiotherapy, that the therapist will do some manual therapy, which is hands-on manipulative therapy of your muscles and tendons. But it's rare to receive anything more than a token rub for a few minutes, if that at least here in the States. Europe may be different. Most of the emphasis here is on insurance billable modalities like e-stim, ultrasound, extracorporeal shockwave therapy, and cryotherapy, icing, despite the fact that tennis elbow is not usually an inflammatory condition. And then there are the rehab exercises you're assigned and have to do on your own anyway. None of this has any significant effect on muscle adhesions or scar tissue. And although eccentric exercise may help tendon regeneration, I don't believe electricity, sound waves, and shock waves have much of an effect on tendon degeneration. And any potential marginal benefit has to be weighed against your cost, as in your time, your travel, inconvenience, and, and cost of repeated trips to the clinic to receive these treatments. From what I've seen, it takes a lot of deep pressure and specific focus to get in there and release stuck muscles and to stimulate stagnant degenerating tendon tissues. Before deciding that you've tried everything, giving up and scheduling surgery, especially if you're on that borderline diagnostically, 
I would recommend going to see a practitioner like myself who specializes in manipulating muscles and tendons and actually treats these root causes. But to be honest, I mean, that can be rather expensive too. So let me quickly suggest one more alternative, especially if you're highly motivated to avoid surgery. And that would be my self-help program, or programs, I should say. I have one program for tennis elbow and one for golfer's elbow, where I teach you the techniques I've been using to help hundreds of people. The cost is minimal. There's a solid guarantee. There's almost no downside, unlike the risks associated with surgery. And it's something you can do at home without going anywhere. And you can put as much energy into it as you're motivated to, depending on how much you really want to avoid surgery, if at all possible. Which, to be clear and upfront, may be a lot if you have some moderate tendon damage and you're, you're already on the verge of surgery. So how do you know when it's time to give up and have the surgery? After you've tried some deep muscle and tendon manipulation for at least a couple of months with a skilled therapist, or on your own at home, better yet, do both. If that doesn't help, and you get an MRI that looks pretty bad, and if your patience is completely gone, you just can't stand the pain and limitations anymore, then maybe it is time for surgery. Although depending on the type of surgery, you'll still have some limitations for at least a few months. Still, I would try PRP injections first, or at least the newer, less invasive 10x procedure before opting for the full open surgery. Okay, that's all I have to say about this for now. Check out the full article for a few more details, including a curious glance into the placebo effect in surgery. And if you're interested, I also have articles about platelet-rich plasma and the sonogram as a diagnostic tool for tennis and golfer's elbow, as well as a couple dozen more articles and videos on everything about these injuries, especially about why the standard treatments like braces, ice, and cortisone shots are not only unhelpful and more likely to slow your recovery, but potentially damaging. And there's my self-help home programs for both golfers and tennis elbow, as I mentioned. All of this is at tenniselbowclassroom.com if you're not already here. And if you're listening to this on YouTube, iTunes, Stitcher, or Facebook, please subscribe and follow me to get my latest episodes first. I hope this was helpful to you, and I wish you all the best. Here's to your full and permanent recovery.